I thought it'd be pretty helpful to learn how each of you wound up as economists and tell us what you do day to day. Uh, let's begin with you, Olu. Th thanks, Rob. Again, uh, good to be with you. So um, I, I grew up in Nigeria and um, we do take economics classes from probably about age, age 14, high school. And it just came easy to me. I didn't like French. I didn't like history. I didn't like a lot of sciences. Um, I did like economics. So I felt that, you know, you're better off doing something that comes easy and that your chances of success are probably higher. And, and that's eventually how I got in. I had to, you know, go against my parents. If you know African parents, you know, they either want you to be a doctor or a lawyer or maybe an accountant. Um, I, you know, I had to make my way to decide, okay, I'm not going to do that. And I'm glad I decided to focus on economics. Uh, so I started my career in m and and advisory, uh, where my work was largely at an institution level. So reading and understanding financial statements, building models, um, and talking to management. Um, I then decided to take two years off uh, to go and do an MBA. In essence, I wanted to know how a, a bit better how the world works uh, and just broaden out beyond the world of accounting, um, corporate finance, and business economics. So in my current role, just to give people just a bit of sense of what I do, I work in the financial stability area of the bank. Um, so typically, the way uh, our analysis feeds into financial stability is uh, we'd end up analyzing, for example, uh, what an emerging trend or stress scenario may mean, um, how banks and other financial institutions may respond to that, and then ultimately what we can do to reduce or remove that risk. So while I was at Tulane University, I began interning in the energy industry for a regulated utility company, Entergy. And then I was hired on full-time in a strategic role that supported buy versus build analyses. So we had a group that forecast energy prices in-house, and then our group analyzed the supply needed um, to purchase available resources or, or whether we needed to build from ground up. So even though as a financial analyst to start off, uh, I was working in an economically focused group. And then after Boston College, I, I joined AEW Capital Management, and they're a global real estate investment firm uh, so I moved from energy into real estate. So I've always worked in real assets and um, I joined their research team. So basically, uh, at a, if you join a real estate investment firm, they have a group, they often have a group of in-house economists uh, that are supporting their um, their acquisition decisions. So um, I was you know, analyz analyzing demand trends, supply trends, forecasting rent growth, looking at demographics. And that was my sort of second job as, a, um, as an economist, this time real estate. So my day-to-day -day now, uh, most recently I joined NIC, um, I focus exclusively on senior housing. So it's housing and care for older adults. And that's very much a growth industry today in the, in the world's aging population. So my day-to-day -day is analyzing demand for senior housing units, um, new supply that's underway, how those two combine and you have the supply and demand, how that creates the occupancy rate and how you can drive rent growth from there. In high school, I wanted to uh, do uh, work experience with a stockbroker and the town that I lived in, it was, a, it was about 150,000 people and the one or two stockbrokers in town couldn't do it. Um, and so there ended up being an economics consultancy that was attached to the local university. So they threw me out there for work experience. I didn't know what I was getting into, but I discovered... Um, while I was there, uh, cost benefit analyses of infrastructure, um, economic data, I had basically, you know, three or four professors, um, you know, just holding my hand for uh, for a, a week or so. And it really uh, opened my opened me up to this world. And I decided, well, that's that's what I want to do. I wanted to become I wanted to become an economist. And so I, I plotted a journey from there, from uh, uh, North Queensland, a small little town all the way to to Canberra, Australia's capital, and then and then into Sydney to uh, uh, the top of the the largest bank and the biggest investment bank, and and all the way to the prime minister too. Uh, what does it entail to work in a financial institution such as a bank, which sits at the heart of the nation's economy, and how does the management thereof differ from the financial management of companies in other industries? So the first one is, I guess, mission. So in our case, it's monetary and financial stability. 
uh, and depending on the type of institution, your mission might be uh, to manage risk or make money for your institution or for your clients or support uh, decision making around lending. Um, the second thing uh, I think uh, I've noted over, over time is uh, the proportion of uh, sort of long term pol policy oriented work uh, is, I, I guess, typically higher than what you'd see elsewhere. So this is sort of, you know, understanding fundamental economic relationships, testing new models, and just generating insights to inform public policy. So a lot of the work is about thinking how the world is changing, but also how uh, some of the tools we have might need to change, uh, because oftentimes the impact of what we do isn't apparent immediately. It uh, sort of takes effect only over time. Uh, and then finally, communication. Um, uh, we have to get our message out there. So we spend a lot of time thinking about what might be the most effective way of doing that. What specific training or skill sets would you recommend for an entry level or transitioning economist aiming to work on the buy side or sell side? I'd say some main skills you need to know are financial analysis and accounting. Because when you're working in a buy side or sell side firm, that's their day to day. So you need to speak the, the same language as the people at the table that you're working with. Um, and, and overall, these firms are looking to their economists as sort of the big picture views and uh, the big brains in the operation. So um, learning to be proactive with your analyses and is one thing to you know sit and forecast economic indicators. But what does that mean for your firm and how can they take advantage of that? Um, and then, you know, if it's not already obvious, data management, data analysis, again, you're sort of the, the big brains in the operation. Um, a lot of the, uh, the people you work with are gonna look to your group as the in-house economist to sort of push a magic button and get the output that they want and the analysis that they need. So. Be analytically excellent, be plugged in, learn to think thoroughly and critically. So history is your best guide. Oftentimes the working assumption is that things haven't fundamentally changed. So, you know, problems and instruments are constantly evolving but uh, it's always instructive to look at, uh, you know, past economic cycles, the role of institutions, human behavior, uh, and my favorite, past crises. So market bubbles, panics, and crashes. So try to be multidisciplinary. So, you know, there's a lot of people who are really good at one thing, but if you can be someone who, for example, can work with data, understand statistics, uh, can get things done as good with people, you can really differentiate yourself. How will the CFA program help if you want to become an economist? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, there are all the things you're learning from the CFA program. But besides that, you know, when you're applying for, for new roles, um, when I was applying to AEW Capital Management and other firms in Boston, I had already passed level one of the CFA program. Mm -hmm. So that really helps you sort of jump out of the stack of resumes that firms are looking at. So, you know, just being a CFA candidate just shows that you're very driven and dedicated to an, uh, an investment industry overall. Mm -hmm. The CFA Institute has an excellent uh, career uh, resource site with um, a bank of job openings, you know, globally. So that's a great place to look uh, as well. Firms, you know, they know that the CFA Institute has this, you know, this great reputation for um, for excellent candidates and charter holders. So. That's a that gives you sort of a, another place to look um, compared to everyone who's um, applying to these roles as well. As an economist, you might find yourself in different types of policymakers' offices, or if you're going into markets, you're going to find yourself in investment decision makers' offices, uh, and you're going to need to be able to communicate those those concepts. And what the CFA does is is it gives you it's like having a second language. And when you do learn a second language, you not only learn something about that culture, but you often take insights and frameworks and thinking into the second language that really helps you understand that a bit better. And it gives you those extra perspectives so that when someone is trying to solve a problem, you have that extra language, that extra little bit of edge and a different frame to help solve a problem and deliver an insight that might be the key thing to a client, whether it's a hedge fund manager or whether you find yourself being pulled into a darkened prime minister's office late one evening to, to explain to him what's Shibor and what's going on um, in China's uh, local government financing uh, or lo with local government finances and what's going on in their money markets. And you're able to kind of communicate to 
a policy wonk like a prime minister, like the one that I work to, um, pretty clearly and, and and succinctly about what's going on. And it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't until I was walking out of the meeting and the hall afterwards, and I turned to my chief of staff and I said, "So what's that about? What that's what's that for?" Oh, he's just preparing. He's uh, in about fifteen minutes. He's jumping on the phone call uh, to talk to Xi Jinping. So he wants to be able to to be across that and be able to discuss the issue. And I'm like, well. I'm really glad I um I was actually very glad for the training uh, and the time that I of the CFA and the time I'd spent in markets. It was a really uh, a crucial addition to that economics and policy background. What books have you read in the past, or what periodicals do you currently subscribe to to stay up to date uh, on important topics in the world of economics? Make sure you read the financial press every day. So Bloomberg is a good resource, but you, you know. Bloomberg, it's hard to get access to it. But at least if you're reading the Wall Street Journal, if you're in the Financial Times, The Economist magazine is a fantastic resource that gives a good global view. And interestingly, every once in a while, I still pull up my macro economics textbooks just to read for fun. I, you know, I do have other things I read for fun, but every once in a while, you just get that itch. What was your text? What was it? Mankiw Economics? Mankiw was a good one. Krugman was a good one. Samuelson was a good one, which Sam goes Nixon. all the way. Yeah, go all the way back. So big three. What advice would you give to your college self? And what steps did you take to approach where you are right now? And if you had the chance to do it all over again, uh, would you take the same path or approach differently? I just wish there were more time in the day, right? So I, you know, I took um, I took more economics classes than were required for my finance degree, uh, but I didn't quite go all the way to the minor or even a double major. Um, so I think you really have to think about how important it is to you what you have on your diploma or your resume versus how you spend your time of how you want to what you want to learn. Um, so I would just think hard about that. Um, as, as you go forward through your uh, through your education but overall you know just make the most of your time take as many classes as you can as you can handle on a, as many subjects as interest you next question is about technical skills um and it, the question is what are the key technical technical skills needed to succeed as an entry level economist so james you were pretty much entry level when you started uh, in economics so what were the key technical skills you felt you needed in that first role you know as a baseline we all need data management um, but uh, you know the statistical analysis uh, that was uh, that was key. But then that statistical analysis moving up to um, you know re fairly reasonable modeling. Um, so you know st you know standard standard regressions, but basically being able to to prove and do a lot of the interrelationships. Um, when you're going into financial markets, I don't think anyone's going to really need you to do any um, CGE. Uh, modeling or, or or that sort of um, you know as as deep as that, uh, but you know those sorts of of technical skills were uh, were good from a numerical perspective. Um, but to go back to, uh, I want to really pull it back to uh, one of the things that Olu said earlier, uh, which was about the communication. It's not just the, mm. uh, the the verbal communication, but the written communication as well. So you know. It might, you know, writing might sort of not be seen as a technical skill, but actually writing in a clear, succinct way that, you know, that is um, for financial market participants, that is um, a real skill that, you, you know, you never, I I make a point of making sure I check in and, and do a writing course refreshes every, you know, kind of two, three years. Same with media skills as well. You know, these, these are part of your being able to, you, you know, you, if you have the best uh, conceptual analytical skills and and modeling skills, if you can't communicate those to clients, they're trapped in your head. Or that, and and if you can't get it onto the page mm -hmm. and get it out, it's not actionable. So how do you make those skills valuable? You know, it's an important piece of of that uh, that puzzle for you as well. So don't overlook that, and you know, go mm -hmm. and focus on uh, on just your um, you know, making great charts in Excel alone.